Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to today's FedSoc Forum. Today, February 5th, 2024, we are excited to present a Justice Suspended, an update in the case of Judge Pauline Newman. My name is Jack Capizzi, and I'm an Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today, we are joined by David Latt, Professor Arthur Hellman, and Judge Jennifer Perkins. For details on their individual bios, please visit our website. After our speakers have given their remarks, we will turn to you for any questions you might have. If you do have a question, please type it into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen at any point, and we will handle questions as we can towards the end of the program. With that, thank you all very much for being with us. Judge Perkins, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Jack, and thank you uh, for setting up this webinar and inviting us to be here today. Um, as noted, we have two very distinguished panelists. Uh, relevant to our purposes, Professor Hellman has direct and robust experience working with the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act, and you will hear more about that from him. Uh, David Latt, in addition to the many hats that he has worn and, and relevant experiences, most recently in the context of his original jurisdiction podcast, recently interviewed Judge Newman, who is the subject of our talk today, and he will share with us about that experience. Um, I do encourage you to check both biographies out, uh, again, event linked at the event page. So my initial task here is to set the stage. So first, our leading characters, both from the Federal Circuit, Chief Judge Kimberly Moore and Judge Pauline Newman. Chief Judge Moore began on the court in 2006, a George W. Bush appointee from her position as a professor at George Mason Law, now Scalia Law. Her primary career po experience post-law school was in academia from 1997 to 2006. And before that, she clerked on the federal circuit for then Chief Judge Glenn Archer and spent a year with Kirkland and Ellis. Judge Pauline Newman began on the court in 1984, a Ronald Reagan appointee. Notably, she was the first judge appointed directly to the federal circuit, which had been formed in 1982. She had advocated in favor of creating the court, in fact. In addition to receiving earlier master's and PhD degrees, Judge Newman received her LLB from NYU in 1958. Uh, she has received several patents before she became a patent attorney. Uh, both women are very impressive and I encourage you to check out their more detailed bios as well. So the second aspect of setting the stage, an overview of the chronology of events leading to the, this point that we are at today. Uh, for a more detailed review, uh, a good place to start would be the new Civil Liberties Alliance's case summary page, which has a lot of the pleadings um, that are relevant. Um, and just a quick note, with no intended disrespect, I'm going to ref refer to the players uh, colloquially moving forward as Moore and Newman. So in mid-February 2023, one year ago, uh, invoking procedural rules of the circuit regarding case backlogs, Moore removes Newman from the April 2023 term, the next term to be set. Early the next month, March 2023, Moore meets privately with Newman, encouraging her to retire. Newman declines. At least one other colleague similarly encourages retirement, and Newman again declines. On March 8th, 2023, the Federal Circuit Judicial Council, made up of Newman's colleagues, suspends her from hearing cases, and she remains suspended today. March 17th, so about two weeks later, Moore drafts an order pursuant to Rule 5 of the Rules of Judicial Conduct alleging Newman was unable to discharge the duties of office by reason of mental or physical disability, but she delays docketing the order for a week to allow Newman to reconsider her decision not to retire. Newman does not do so. One week later, Moore dockets the order and begins formal investigative processes under Rule 11 of the Rules of Judicial Conduct into the disability allegations. Moore issues a separate order appointing herself and two other judges pursuant to the rules to a special committee to investigate the matter. April 6th, Moore expands the investigation to, to include allegations of misconduct regarding an employment dispute, dispute uh, with Newman's paralegal. The next day, April 7th, the special committee orders Newman to undergo medical testing and respond within four days. April 13th, Moore again expands the scope of investigation, this time for Newman's failure to comply with that April 7th order. April 17th, the special committee orders Newman to turn over medical information and requests that she sit for a videotaped interview. Newman has three days to reply. On April 19th, 
Moore reassigns Newman's judicial assistant and paralegal and a law clerk to another judge. The next day, Moore once again expands the scope of investigation to, to include allegations of inappropriate and retaliatory behavior toward Chambers staff and members of the IT department. The next day, April 21st, Newman, who now has counsel, the New Civil Liberties Alliance, sends a letter to Moore identifying factual errors in the previously identified orders, contending that suspension of Newman while the process is ongoing is unauthorized and requesting a transfer to another judicial council to a different circuit. May 3rd, the special committee issues two orders. The first order declines to request a transfer and reimposes the requirements to turn over medical records, undergo psychiatric evaluations, and sit for an interview. The second order imposes a gag order on Newman and counsel and threatens sanctions for noncompliance. That same day, the Judicial Council, and again, the Special Committee and Judicial Council are different things here, uh, also issues an order denying transfer to another circuit. A few days later, May 9th, Newman sends a new letter to Moore that, among other things, objects to the gag order and again requests transfer to a different circuit. The next day, Newman files her lawsuit in the District Court for the District of Columbia, requesting a preliminary injunction against her continued suspension and against the gag order. May 16th, so about a week after the lawsuit is filed, the Special Committee issues two orders. The first order again requires Newman to sit for a psychiatric examination and a videotaped interview. The committee narrows the requirement that Newman turn over medical records, but now orders her to turn them over to the testing physicians and not the committee itself. The committee orders Newman to respond within one week. And this order also clarifies the gag order. Um, so if, let's see that one week later, or a little over a week later, May 25th, Newman writes to the special committee declining to comply with that May 16th order. She states she is entirely willing to undergo necessary testing, provide necessary records, and meet with a special committee, provided that she is immediately restored to her rights and duties as a judge, and further provided that this matter is promptly transferred to a judicial council of another circuit. May 26th, Moore expands the scope of investigation again to include failure to comply with that May 16th order. On June 1st, the special committee narrows its investigation to whether the failure to cooperate constitutes misconduct and it schedules oral argument in front of itself, the special committee, for July 13th. June 5th, the Judicial Council issues an order to reconsider what was a previously unreported and unrecorded March 8th decision, that first decision, uh, which had kept Newman suspended from hearing cases throughout this time period. The Judicial Council finds that Newman is unduly delaying resolution of cases and continues her suspension, quote, pending further order of the Judicial Council. One month later, July 5th, Newman submits her letter brief and attaches a report of a neurological exam attesting that she is able to continue her work. And then oral argument is held before the committee. The end of July, July 31st, a few days before the mediation and the pending district court matter, the special committee produces a 111 page report and recommendation concluding that Newman's failure to submit to testing interviews and turnover medical records constitutes misconduct and recommends a one year renewable suspension. On September 20th, the Judicial Council adopts this report and the proposed one year renewable suspension as a sanction. November 1st, Newman files a petition for review with the Judicial Conference's Committee on Judicial Conduct and Disability. That ethics track matter remains pending today. November 8th, the Judicial Council vacates its June 5th suspension order, but that does not affect the September 20th order adopting the Special Committee's report. And then January 25th, most recently, the district court held oral argument on the motion to dismiss Newman's uh, district court complaint. And unless somebody else has heard something, that is where we stand today. We haven't heard back from the district court uh, or any further from the parties. So that's our lay of the land. Um, what I'd like to do now is turn this over to Professor Hellman uh, to give us a brief uh, overview of the relevant law. Uh, thank you, uh, Judge Perkins. Well, I've, I've written many, many pages about the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act of 
1980. But here I'm just going to stick to the very basics as they affect this, this proceeding. This 1980 Act created a single system for handling complaints of misconduct or disability on the part of federal judges. What is that system? It is a system of judicial self-regulation, and it's a system that is decentralized, it is non-adversary, and it is forward-looking. Those are the essential characteristics. Primary responsibility for considering complaints against judges is lodged with two sets of actors, circuit chief judges and the judicial councils of the circuits. These circuit councils are regional units of governance they were established by Congress back in 1939. Now, ordinarily, a case begin a proceeding begins with the filing of a complaint with the clerk of the Court of Appeals for the circuit, and that complaint goes to the chief judge who reviews it. In the alternative, the chief judge can initiate a proceeding by identifying a complaint, and as Judge Perkins has described, that is what happened here. From that point, the proceeding can follow either of two tracks. Track one is what I call the chief judge track. After reviewing the complaint and perhaps conducting a limited inquiry, the chief judge dismisses the complaint. And in fact, all but a tiny, tiny fraction of the complaints are disposed of on this uh, chief judge track. Track two is the special committee track. This is for complaints that may have substance. And that's because under the act, the chief judge may not make any findings of fact about any matter that is reasonably in dispute. So if there are disputes, there has to be a special committee and the special committee then carries out an investigation and reports to the judicial council. It's the judicial council that has the power to take action, including uh, imposing discipline if it finds misconduct or disability. Um, here, as Judge Perkins has described, the counsel found that Judge Newman had engaged in misconduct by refusing to cooperate with the special committee investigation. The final step is review of the counsel action by the uh, Committee on Judicial Conduct and Disability of the Judicial Conference of the United States. Now, the Judicial Conference is the administrative policy-making body for the entire federal judiciary. And again, as Judge uh, Perkins has described, a petition for review has been filed with the uh, Conduct Committee, as it's sometimes called, and we are waiting for its, uh, its decision. So that's where the matter stands as far as the judicial conduct proceeding, which again is distinct from the district court proceeding. That is something uh, quite unusual that we have in this case, these, these two separate proceedings. Uh, Judge Perkins, back to you. Thank you, Professor. And just as an aside, the, the professor was involved in an earlier webinar related to this topic, and there's a perhaps more robust discussion of the laws. If that's something you're interested in, it's on the Federal Society's website. It occurred in July of 2023, I think July 26th. Um, so I encourage you to go watch or listen to that webinar for a little bit more detail on the law. Um, at this point, I, we'd like to hear from Mr. Latt about his experience in interviewing uh, Judge Newman and additional investigative work that I know he has been doing on this topic. Sure. Thank you so much, Judge. Thank you, Professor Hellman. This matter has been going on for almost a year, as the judge mentioned in her opening background, and I've been covering it for pretty much the entire time that it has, it has been public on my Substack newsletter, Original Jurisdiction. For months, I followed the issues uh, and focused on the due process issue and the refusal to transfer the case to another circuit. But for quite some time, I remained silent on the underlying issue of Judge Newman's fitness or mental acuity. I really felt I had no basis to opine on that, but those of you who have been following this case will know that there have been a number of allegations and anecdotes and stories that are somewhat uh, gossipy or salacious that make Judge Newman sound like she is for lack of a better technical term, totally out of it. Uh, but I was not focused on those issues. I was focused on the issues of process and fairness. I did read articles in other outlets like the Washington Post and Bloomberg, where reporters went to Judge Newman's chambers and 
said that she seemed quite lucid and quite with it and reported that she walked uh, across her very large and beautiful chambers with apparent ease and similar things. But again, I had not done any firsthand reporting, so I noted these with interest, but again, I was not going to opine on Judge Newman's fitness. But late last year, I thought to myself, well, maybe I should take a closer look. And so I invited Judge Newman on my podcast. And to my uh, pleasant, uh, I wouldn't, maybe I wouldn't say surprise, as she has been doing media, but um, I was pleased to see that she accepted. And I thought that a 30-minute to one-hour interview would give me a good sense of her abilities. But ahead of that, the judge and I and her counsel and clerks thought it might be a good idea for us to meet in person. So on Thursday, January 4, I went down to Chambers and met with her there. And I spent time with her and uh, two of her current law clerks and one of her former law clerks, Greg Dolan of the NCLA, who's representing her. Uh, Greg was only there for a short time, really. Uh, he wanted to let the judge speak for herself. And much of the time I spent there was actually just with the judge uh, on her own. Uh, but uh, then we had lunch with the clerks and then the four of us chatted for a while. And I have to say that I spent four hours in chambers with her. And we were conversing pretty much the entire time. And she walked the length of her chambers several times. And she showed me, lifted them up off the wall and showed me some of the patents that she obtained. And during the entire four hours, she was perfectly lucid. During the entire four hours, she did not have a so-called senior moment or anything like that. I had read in one of the articles that she was breaking in a new pair of hearing aids. So I spoke very slowly and loudly the whole time, but I do not recall during the four hours whether she even asked me to repeat myself even once. She seemed to be in great, great condition. And I came away from the, the four hours thinking she does not seem disabled any, in any sense in which we might use the term. And the uh, per judge that I saw was utterly inconsistent with the portrait of this doddering and totally uh, out of it judge that was painted in the special committee report. But then I thought to myself, look, maybe she was having a, a good day. Uh, now, look, if you look in the, and many of you, I'm sure, are practitioners in the federal circuit, and some of you have seen Judge Newman at conferences and such, she has made a number of public appearances, and people have reported that she has spoken fluently and perhaps extemporaneously on some very complex issues, uh, the America Invents Act, Section 101, et cetera. And she seemed, again, totally with it and cognitively uh, not disabled. Uh, but again, um, I thought to myself, well, maybe this four hours was an aberration. So I interviewed her the following week, Friday, January 12. It was a different time of day. Uh, it was a different format. And you can listen to that entire podcast over at Original Jurisdiction. Uh, I posted it, and you can make your own judgments. But I'm going to actually share with you two video clips. Now, those of you who follow my podcast know that I normally don't do video. But the judge actually suggested, and this was her idea, that I post some video because she thought to her, she thought that people seeing her as well as hearing her would actually get a better sense that she's actually quite with it. So um, I'm going to experiment with this. I've, I've only done this once in our practice session, but let me try and share uh, two brief clips with you now. Um, let me just just give me a second. Okay, here is the first clip. Speaking of computer stuff, IT stuff. One of the allegations about you is that you were unable to sit through this basic computer training and answer some simple questions about the training. What do you say about that? Is that true? It's outrageous, to put it mildly. Not only is it outrageous, but it is a conspicuous, verifiable falsehood. The head of the IT department swore that I failed the tests, the, the training tests 20 times. To my credit or discredit, I never took the test. <laughs> so they can't possibly have any records of my taking the test and failing. It was, I forget how long it took, half an hour, hour. I always had something more pressing and I had no trouble at all doing what I needed to do on the computer. I also had a very talented staff. All the young people who are law clerks are generally skilled in computer activities. If there's something 
that needs to be done. And so it was rare. And I'm sure that their records, I assume they keep a log of the services that the help desk provides, will show how very rarely I asked them for help. And then uh, let me play one more clip. Um, this is also quite short. Um, this is from my interview with the judge. Well, let me go back then and ask again, uh, why do you think your longtime colleagues are trying to oust you from the bench? I think our conversation has shown that you are perfectly intelligent and lucid. So. Why are they doing this to you if you are not, in fact, disabled? I cannot understand. They're the only I ask everybody this question, and the only answer that they get is that they're afraid of the chief judge, which ought to be incomprehensible. What are they afraid of? That she'll do the same thing to them that she's doing to me, or what? And chief judges have a term that seven years, they're not here forever. And it's the only explanation that anyone has ever given me. They also say that they, they don't mind, since I write dissents, they don't mind getting rid of me because uh, dissents are critical. And everyone knows that more often than not, my dissents are taken my side is taken eventually. And so, so I don't know the answer to that, but I am learning in my old age things about human nature that I would prefer not to know. So I think that is a very eloquent expression of how the judge feels about what is going on. She is learning things in her old age about human nature that she would prefer not to know because it does very much seem that she is being ganged up on. And again, I encourage you to listen to the full interview, podcast interview. These were just short, short clips. The interview is about 51 minutes. It has been very, uh, very lightly edited and not for any kind of substantive reason. I was not trying to edit it to somehow make Judge, New you know, to, to cut out the 10 minute section where she kind of drools on herself. Like it's, you know, it is a very fair and accurate representation of the entirety uh, of our conversation. I just want to make a few comments on the substance of those clips that I showed you. One of them was about the computer training. So one of the juicy allegations is that Judge Newman could not answer basic questions about this computer training. It is Judge Newman's contention that, uh, to her credit or discredit, as she said in an interview with me, she never took the training. As she put it in our four-hour meeting, she said, uh, I'm sorry, but I have better things to do with my remaining time on this earth than take a computer training. So she claims she never took it. Not that she took it and repeatedly failed the simple basic quiz, which is the claim of the IT department, but that she never took it. Now, there are, there are actual factual disagreements, and a lot of the disagreements, um, you know, they, they start from some kind of germ of truth, and then they get turned into something that, according to Judge Newman, and uh, I guess you could call them Team Newman, you know, is not correct. Another thing she mentioned in our interview, she said that her judicial assistant or paralegal, who came up in the background that Judge Perkins mentioned, claimed that she was unable to walk down the hallway to her chambers. And so they installed chairs so that when she was walking down the hallway, she could take a break and then finish her walk. Judge Newman pointed out to me in the podcast that, yes, it is true. There were chairs installed in the hallway outside her chambers. The exact same chairs were installed one floor above on the floor outside Judge Moore's office. So again, there's always a germ of truth, and then it gets turned into something else. She failed the computer training. She failed it because she never took it, not because she couldn't answer the simple questions. They had chairs put in the hallway outside of her office, not because she's unable. It was some kind of general court renovation or update. Um, here is uh, another, um, you know, another example of something that kind of starts and then turns into something else. Uh, Judge, uh, there has been a claim that Judge Newman uh, suffered a heart attack. Judge Newman told me, and she said to me that she always knocks wood when she says this, but she said, "I have never had a heart attack." Now, is it true that she has had a pacemaker and has had one for years and not had any issues with it? Yes, that is true. 
but she never had a heart attack. So again, there was a heart issue, but not the one that's claimed. So whenever you read the report, that giant 100 plus page report, always add, don't, don't necessarily think that what you're reading there is true. Um, I'm going to be doing some more reporting on this. I am doing some reporting on this, as Judge Perkins mentioned. And if any of you have firsthand information, please reach out to me. I'm at davidlatt at substack.com. But there's a lot that I am uncovering, which really calls into question the accuracy of some of the items that are in the report and recommendation of the committee. I just don't know that I trust all of what's in there, especially after I saw Judge Newman and spent five hours with her myself. Now, I will make a concession here. It is quite possible that even if she can carry on a conversation or present at a conference, maybe she is having a hard time discharging her judicial duties. And I think it is certainly true that she is one of the slower judges on the circuit. Now, you can debate over whether she is the slowest. It depends on what kind of measures or statistics you use. Uh, on the podcast, Judge Newman has a long section where she goes through and looks at who has the oldest opinions, and many times it's not her. Um, but um, the, as, as Greg Dolan pointed out in the recent hearing before Judge Cooper, the federal circuit has existing rules that say that if you have X opinions that are older than six months and Y opinions or uh, cases that are older than a year, you are kept off the next calendar. And it is the contention of Judge Newman, and a, a perfectly valid one, it seems to me, that this rule, which applies to all judges, not judges who, like Judge Newman, say have a tendency to dissent a lot, but all judges, this rule should be adequate to address any kind of slowdowns. And if she has slowdowns that violate this existing rule that is applicable to all judges, then sure, she can be kept off the calendar. But there shouldn't be some kind of special Judge Newman rule, which kind of seems to be the case uh, today. Um, so again, it's not clear to me why the existing rules are not sufficient to address slowness. It is also not clear to me, and this was hinted at by Judge Cooper in the hearing, why Judge Newman couldn't be temporarily reinstated at some kind of reduced caseload. She has no backlog now. She cleared her entire backlog back in October or November of last year. So really, uh, there is no claim anymore that she's holding up the administration of justice or harming the interests of litigants. She hasn't had cases in uh, in months. She has been uh, kept kept off the bench, even though she has a presidential commission and is a duly appointed Article III judge. She has not been impeached, but she has been prevented from hearing cases, even though she no longer has any backlog and is in compliance with the internal rules of the federal circuit about whether you have six month or one year old cases. I would say just in closing that I think there is a kind of pettiness or, or vindictiveness to this process that is quite unseemly. I don't know why this couldn't have been worked out. Now, I think Judge Moore would say, well, I did try to work it out. I, I told her to go senior and she didn't. Um, but I just don't understand why there can't be at this point some kind of intermediate step where maybe she could be brought back to the bench on a temporary basis with a very limited number of cases. I She's clearly very frustrated and upset about her inability to do the uh, job that she loves. And uh, two other final points I will make. She mentioned in one of the clips I showed you about her dissents. I do think that's part of it. I don't think that the move to ouster from the bench is primarily ideological, but she it has been called in uh, law review articles the great dissenter of that court. And I think what's happening to her does raise the specter of judges being pushed off the bench because of substantive or ideological disagreements with their colleagues. She also noted that she is very frequently vindicated. And she is, if you look at the Supreme Court, the most frequently vindicated federal circuit judge. Uh, her cases, cases in which she wrote a dissent, uh, are picked up, granted cert, at a higher rate than average cases. And she had nine such cases, according to this paper by Daryl Lim, that went up to the Supreme Court. And in eight out of the nine, the position taken in her dissent was vindicated by the Supreme Court. So maybe she's slower than average, but you know, being correct has to count for something too. So I think that that is one thing to point out, that she is, in some substantive ways, out of step with her colleagues. And it raises this troubling prospect of whether she's being sidelined because of these disagreements. And then um, I guess the last thing I would say is I think it is quite appropriate that the district court case is captioned 
um, uh, Newman v. Moore. Um, this very much seems to be something that is being pursued by the chief judge. If you look at the record, you have not seen any other active judges speaking publicly in favor of the uh, move to sideline Judge Newman. Nobody has said, oh, goodness, you know, uh, I uh, you can't have a coherent conversation with her. She's completely addled. You, you go visit her in chambers and she stares off into space. No active judge has said anything like this. And furthermore, the two uh, two former chief judges who no longer have to fear anything from Chief Judge Moore, two former chief judges of the federal circuit have spoken out and have attested to Judge Newman being completely with it. Uh, one of them said, look, she's still the same old Polly I've always known. So again, I think that there are some questions here, some factual questions. And Judge Newman uh, told me in our many meetings that she hopes that the district court case goes forward because she would like there to be discovery of the people who are making these allegations. Sure, we have statements, including some sworn statements, but she would like to test them with cross-examination. She would like these people to be deposed. She would like the opportunity to submit counter evidence. Now, again, just sorry, I know I said final point and I've said it several times, but this is really my final point. I do think that the main issue here is the process issue, that this was not transferred to another circuit. And I think Professor Hellman has some thoughts on that. So I don't want to uh, lose track of that. I'm still the most troubled by how this has been handled. But I do think that on the under on the underlying issue of Judge Newman's fitness, an issue that I stayed quiet on for, I don't know, seven, eight months because I just felt I had no basis for forming an opinion. I guess suffice it to say that there are reasons to doubt uh, that to, to, there are reasons to doubt some of the claims that have been made about Judge Newman. Thank you, David. And I, uh, as somebody who has watched the podcast, I do um, highly recommend anybody who's interested in this issue to go watch the podcast in its entirety. Uh, Professor Hellman, I know you did want to speak a little bit, provide your own commentary on some of the issues that maybe give you pause or that that raise some concerns. You know, we've heard a lot about the factual evidence and and contrary evidence, um, but I, I think you did want to speak more on the on the procedural and legal side. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Judge. Uh, but but uh, prelimin preliminarily, I, I will say, I, I think we're all in David's debt for conducting that interview and for making the videos available to the public so that people can, can judge for themselves. I mean, I at the very least, I agree with David that they raise questions about whether the federal circuit was justified in suspending Judge Newman from hearing cases before the proceedings under the 1980 Act were concluded. But I'm going to put that question to uh, one side for now, because I will concentrate, as you suggested, on matters of procedure under the 1980 Act. Now, the legislative history of that Act, which is a House report, includes a remarkable paragraph, which I'm going to quote here. The potential excesses of a circuit council must be controlled. As a consequence, what is now Section uh, 358 of the Judicial Code requires that minimal due process rights be accorded any judicial officer whose actions or state of health are being investigated by the circuit council. And the report continues by saying, the net effect of this paragraph is that the possibility of one group of federal judges ganging up or hazing another judge is prevented. So Congress recognized when it enacted the statute that the process it established could potentially enable one group of federal judges to gang up on another judge. The Congress also thought that the safeguards that it built into the act would prevent that from happening. Here though, for the first time in the history of the act, 40 year history of the act, I think there's reason to be concerned that something like that has, is, is going on and that the safeguards have not been sufficient. Now, I don't say that lightly because it is a very disturbing thing to, to have to say. What I'd like to do now is to explain why there is cause for concern. And there are three aspects of this proceeding that are troubling and the concerns actually reinforce one another. First, as David has mentioned, the failure to request a transfer to another circuit. Second, the shift from a focus on disability to a focus on failure to cooperate which is a, a form of misconduct, not disability. Third, suspending Judge Newman from hearing cases on a changing array of rationales before uh, the council completed the proceedings specified in the act. Okay, the transfer. It was actually the first set of nationally binding rules 
for misconduct proceedings adopted in 2008 that authorized the chief circuit judge to request a transfer uh, by the chief justice uh, to another circuit. And since then, since 2008, in every instance where the accusations against a circuit judge have been serious enough to require the uh, appointment of a special committee, the chief judge has requested a transfer and the transfer has been granted. Now, when the news of this proceeding was first leaked, which is the way we found out about it, I assume that Chief Judge Newman would, uh, would, uh, uh, would invoke that procedure, but she did not. And now in several opinions, she, the council and the committee have all attempted to defend that decision. I don't find any of those uh, explanations persuasive. And the key fact is this, the underlying allegations are allegations of disability that impair, impairs Judge Newman's ability to carry out her responsibilities as an appellate judge. Well, appellate judges decide cases in panels with other members of the court. So those other judges would be the primary witnesses in the determination of disability. But in the federal circuit, those judges are all the members of the judicial council. The circuit judges, active judges equals circuit council. So the conflict seems obvious there. But it's actually worse than that. The special committee report tells us that while it was carrying out its investigation of Judge Newman, court employees were constantly coming to the committee with new reports of incidents involving the judge. So the committee not only listened to them, but in several instances helped them to find alternative work arrangements. Now, I find that quite remarkable. In, in other words, while the committee is carrying out its investigation, it's receiving this raw, unfiltered information from employees who are often distraught or upset. And that's no way to carry out a dispassionate investigation. Not only that, but the committee was taking steps to protect or relocate these employees. Now you'd think the federal circuit uh, would have an ombudsman or an EDR department that has the authority, the expertise and the resources to resolve complaints about workplace conditions. But here you have article three judges designated as fact finders in this proceeding authorized by Congress taking over that function. Now, amazingly, the special committee thinks this is one of the reasons why the proceeding should not have been transferred. I think it shows exactly the opposite, why it should have been. Second problem is the way a disability proceeding has been turned into a misconduct proceeding. Now it's true that the order identifying the complaint issued in March, uh, 2023, specified both misconduct and disability. But as Judge Perkins noticed, noted, by April, the focus was on disability. And the special committee ordered Judge Newman to undergo a neurological examination and neurological testing to determine if there was a disability. So that was what the fight was all about. But when Judge Newman resisted those orders, Chief Judge Moore expanded the investigation to consider whether the failure to cooperate constituted misconduct. And then by June 1st, the special committee had narrowed the investigation to focus solely on whether this uh, failure to cooperate constituted misconduct. Now you can see why that was significant because as the, mis as the committee explained, the misconduct question could be resolved on the paper record and on legal arguments. There were, as the committee put it, no percipient fact witnesses to additional events that were relevant to the misconduct determination. So no percipient witnesses meant that Judge Newman's counsel had no opportunity to cross-examine the employees who were the primary source of the allegations of disability. It also meant that there was no need to seek testimony from the only people who had actually participated in the decisional process with Judge Newman, the other judges of the federal circuit. And that in turn was given as a reason why there was no conflict of interest requiring transfer to another circuit. Now, it may be going too far to call this a bait and switch, but by shifting the focus solely to failure to cooperate, the special committee made it unnecessary to hear any testimony from anyone 
uh, relevant to the underlying allegations about disability. And that brings me to the third area of concern, which is the multiple orders suspending Judge Newman from hearing cases before the proceedings under the act concluded. Now we could spend our entire hour and more uh, trying to get these various orders straight, but I wanna concentrate on what happened at the very outset. And again, some of this uh, Judge Perkins has narrated, but um, I want to look at the details. On March 8th, the Judicial Council voted that Judge Newman would not be assigned any new cases. Now, at that time, <clears throat> Judge Moore had not initiated the misconduct proceedings or any formal proceeding. But in an April 5th email, <clears throat> she said that the council had voted not to assign Judge Newman to sit on any new cases pending the results of the investigation into potential disability slash misconduct identified in the order which you have been given. And if that was not clear enough, Judge Moore added that Judge Newman will not be assigned <clears throat> any new cases until these proceedings are resolved. So this was a suspension based on concerns about misconduct or disability. That's very troubling because based on the text and history of the act, I believe that the act provides the exclusive means by which an Article III judge can be suspended from hearing cases based on concerns about misconduct or disability. Two sections of the code are relevant. Section 358, as I've said, provides numerous safeguards for the judge who's under investigation. Section 354 lists the sanctions that the council can impose after the investigation has com been completed. And the most serious sanction is, for an Article III judge is ordering that on a temporary basis, for a time certain, no further cases be assigned to the subject judge. It would entirely subvert the procedural protections that Congress so carefully built into the act if the council could sub, uh, suspend a judge based on concerns about misconduct or disability without following the procedures uh, specified in the act. Now that March suspension, as we've heard, has been superseded. So it, it's a moot issue as a legal matter, but together with the failure to transfer and the switch from disability to misconduct, it points to a serious process failure that I think transcends the immediate issue of whether or not Judge Newman is disabled. All right, thank you, Professor Hillman. Um, I, I haven't mentioned to this point the Q&A function in part because questions have been popping up, so it seems like we have a, an experienced audience, but I will note that we are uh, gonna attempt to answer some of the questions from our audience. Please use that Q&A function to submit your questions. Um, before I jump into that, I, I kind of want to jump off something that that you were just talking about, Professor Hillman, and that something that we had discussed uh, before this webinar. It, during the hearing, Judge um, Cooper had asked Judge Newman's counsel about, you know, what what about a situation where there are credible disability allegations? Isn't there a public interest in keeping the judge? from sitting on cases pending the results of the investigation. As, as Jeff, Judge Cooper asked, if you were a litigant, wouldn't you want, would you want that judge on your case? Meaning that judge uh, against whom there are credible allegations of disability. Um, what are your thoughts on that, uh, Professor Hillman or, or David, if you wanna jump in on that? Well, maybe I'll jump in first here. Well, uh, it's, it's a good question and there are two answers, uh, the legal and the policy. The legal, I think, is that Congress did not provide for suspending an Article III judge while the council investigates allegations of disability. Now, that may actually have been an oversight because for almost the entire time the act was under consideration, the focus was on misconduct, not disability. So, so I don't want to rest on that legality. I, 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 let's, let's turn to the, uh, the policy considerations. Of course, I to answer Judge Cooper's question, I wouldn't want a disabled judge hearing my case. But let's look at what's at stake here. We're not talking about, for example, suspending the operating room privileges of a surgeon 
against whom credible allegations of disability have been uh, made. In that situation, obviously, we don't want the surgeon slicing into somebody's liver uh, while the investigation goes on. But that's not what's at stake here. We're talking about an appellate judge who decides cases based on a written record, an oral argument, and always with at least two other judges on the panel. So what's the worst thing that can happen if the disabled judge sits on a case? The case has to be re-argued by a reconstituted panel. And even now, there's a cost to that. It's not ideal. But in many cases, you would not even need to do that because the other judges, the other two judges constitute a quorum. And if they agree, you don't need to, to do it again. There's also, it seems to me, something to be gained. If Judge Newman had been sitting on cases in, let's just say, April, or sorry, May and June of last year, we have a solid basis for determining whether she is disabled. Uh, the, or the oral argument is public. So everybody would be able to see, did she engage in give and take with counsel, or did she sit silently and stare into space? At the judge's private conference after the argument, did she engage in cogent discussion with the other judges, or did she repeatedly wander off topic? I think it's very likely that we would now uh, have a very solid basis for making the determination, and very likely we wouldn't even need a, a, a neurological examination. But uh, maybe I, I've missed something. David, I'd really like to hear your take on this. No, I, I don't think you've missed anything, Professor. And again, I agree with you. We have to look at the nature of her role. She is an appellate judge. They sit in panels of three. The other two judges do constitute a quorum. I have seen cases where circuits have issued opinions with the votes and support of the two judges. The argument about why this wasn't transferred, I find, along as you do, wholly unpersuasive. The argument is essentially, look, we're the closest to the circumstances. We know what's going on. People are coming to us in real time with evidence. Would you want a fact finder who actually had personal knowledge of the facts and who was continuing to get facts while the matter was being adjudicated? No, we want our fact finders to be neutral. We don't want the judge and the jury in a case to know the players and to know the underlying facts. We want them to be tabula rasa. And so the idea that this is somehow, you know, um, a feature, not a bug. No, it's a bug. You can't have these cases adjudicated by people with personal interests. And so this is why, as you pointed out, Professor, every case involving allegations against a circuit judge has been transferred to another circuit. Because remember, these circuit councils mostly get complaints about other judges, district judges, magistrate judges, bankruptcy judges, and they, ad they address, they rule on, they investigate these complaints against other judges. But when it's a colleague of theirs, somebody they may like or dislike, somebody whose vote they might want in a case, somebody they might feel overshadowed by. They're, they're personal issues here. And as a result, this really should uh, have been transferred. But again, I just found it, find it, found it so ridiculous when the, uh, when the report was making it sound like uh, not sidelining her immediately was going to be uh, in, causing danger. Uh, she said she's a lovely 96-year-old woman. Nobody is being endangered. Like, you know, relax. All right. Thank you both. Um, I want to try to uh, categorize some of the, we have a few different questions about the factual disputes that were going on. And I think to some degree, what you have just spoken about kind of answers those. I, we're not here to provide what is the answer to, you know, whether or not she had a heart attack or whether or not she fainted and under what circumstances or those, uh, whether or not she took a computer class. I think the point, um, and correct me if I'm wrong or, or feel free to comment on this, the point that we're raising today and that I think is worthy of discussion is uh, who was the fact finder in this dispute? And the fact finder was somebody who was on one side of those facts. Um, Chief Judge Moore is the one who raised these allegations of the heart attack and the computer class and, and various other things. And then she was also the one who sat as head of the council and head of the special committee, both of which engaged in fact finding functions um, with the party that she was in disagreement with. Um, so I, I guess it, you can also see those questions, but are there any other comments that you'd like to make on some of those factual disputes? Perhaps, David, this is uh, sure. more directed at you. 
So again, I'm still doing some investigation, but one thing that appears to be the case, according to Judge Newman's camp, and uh, I've reached out to the the Federal Circuit, and uh, uh, they said that because of the pending proceedings, they're they're not going to comment. But according to Judge Newman's camp, the JA or the paralegal who we believe or I believe was the person to file the complaint that was identified by Judge Moore, this person had issues with Judge Newman. Uh, this person is arguably a disgruntled ex-employee. Uh, this is not a neutral evaluator of Judge Newman's competence. This is somebody who, according to Judge Newman, was, uh, shall we say, had issues with Judge Newman. Um, they claim uh, did not uh, respect her authority. Uh, they claim uh, did not do a good job with their duties as JA or paralegal, and now is making all of these negative claims against Judge Newman. So as to all the factual questions that have been raised in the Q&A, let me just pose one thing. Whenever you read an allegation, a factual allegation in this case, ask yourself, is it supported by anything other than some employee's statement, because one of the employees is disgruntled, and it is the claim of Team Newman that the other employees are trying to curry favor with Chief Judge Moore. So just ask yourself, is there a piece of documentary evidence? Is there a log of the help desk? Is there video like my video and my audio of Judge Newman? What proof do you have beyond testimony of either a disgruntled employee or somebody trying to curry favor with Chief Judge Newman? Ask yourself as to every piece of evidence, what other piece of evidence is there? So I, again, I think that sort of is an overarching response to a lot of these comments, but I would also say, there's an issue here of, of burden of proof. Like, has this have these claims been established? And has Judge Newman had the opportunity to probe them and to test them? Uh, and the other thing I would ask on the, on the medical examinations, you will see in the record, medical professionals, uh, you know, retained by Judge Newman have filed reports, and they're consistent with what I observed, that she is a very cognitively intact 96-year-old woman. The reason that Judge Newman does not want to submit to the medical professionals to be chosen by Judge Moore is, to be frank, I don't think Judge Moore, a uh, Judge Newman, I don't think Judge Newman trusts the medical professionals uh, to that are going to be selected by Judge Moore. Now, maybe that trust, maybe that distrust is warranted, or maybe it's not. But if this had been transferred to another circuit, we wouldn't have this issue. Judge Newman has already publicly stated that if this matter is transferred to the Judicial Council of another circuit, she will submit to whatever medical or neurological testing is ordered by that other circuit. She just doesn't want to be examined by the hand-picked professionals of Kimberly Moore. Uh, one of the first questions in the in the queue kind of raises this issue of um, denying somebody, denying a judge the ability to sit, uh, particularly as regards the en banc um, uh, panel processes without an impeachment process underway. Perhaps, Professor Hellman, you could talk to us about um, the the overlap or the gap, uh, if any, between the, the judicial conduct process um, and the impeachment process. I know there have been some commentators that have suggested, you know, the Constitution has given us a process for dealing with judges. Should that be just the process as opposed to uh, the statutes that we have enacted? And I guess I just do you have any comments that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, sure. Um, the there was a great deal of debate prior to the enactment of the 1980 Act about whether uh, judicial councils or, or anybody would have authority to suspend a, a judge um, um, or do anything to take a judge off cases that would that would be something different from the, the impeachment process. And I think Congress gave us its answer to that question by enacting the act, and as I suggested in my uh, previous remarks, by making the procedures within uh, within the act, the exclusive means by which this could be done. In other words, Congress agreed with those who said that some limited suspension of an Article III judge outside of impeachment is permissible, but it has to be done under carefully safeguarded procedures. So that I think if this were done um, under the act's procedures, you know, Congress at least thought after very, very careful consideration that that legislative process went on for years, that that was okay. But it's not okay when it's done outside 
the confines of the act as, as was done here. I would also add that NCLA's contention is that there are constitutional problems with the act. And again, I refer you to their website and their briefing. Um, I have not personally looked at the issue closely enough to feel I'm comfortable with uh, opining on it, but there, there are arguments on both sides for whether or not the act, which is, as Professor Hellman was saying, the exclusive means, whether impeachment should be the exclusive means. So one of our, our questions is about um, the availability of, of amendment to the rules that would mandate uh, a chief judge of one circuit cannot review allegations of peers on the same circuit. So it sounds like the question is sort of framed as this, this would not affect review of complaints or potential complaints against district court magistrate bankruptcy judges. But when you raise it to the circuit judge level, um, and, and I, I think the answer is yes, it's possible to amend it. I, I, I wonder if either of you have any thoughts on whether that should be uh, something considered, making it mandatory, no longer leaving open the question whether you request a transfer, but making it an obligation on the part of any chief judge. Um, any I like it. <laughs> <Professor>? <laughs> well, I guess what I'll, what I'll say is uh, I actually suggested something like that in, in an article I wrote a few years ago before the Newman matter uh, ever arose, that I pointed out, as David and I have both done, that it had already, by the time I wrote this article, it was already the established practice uh, with respect to complaints against circuit judges, and I suggested that it should be codified in the rule. Uh, the, the one qualification on that is I, I do think it is okay for a chief judge to, to handle a, a, a case on what I've called track one. In other words, if the, if the complaint is plainly frivolous or a challenge to the merits of the decision, the chief judge should be able to dismiss the complaint without having to bother the chief justice or to send it to another circuit. The, the dividing line ought to be if the chief judge finds that the complaint cannot be dismissed, the, the proceeding cannot be um, concluded based on intervening events or something like that. So there's gonna to have to be a special committee. If it's a special committee case, there should be a, a requirement that the chief judge request the transfer. Now the chief justice could still deny, uh, deny it. I, I would. I would give the chief justice that discretion, but the, the circuit chief judge should not have the discretion to do what Judge Moore did here to appoint her own special committee to handle the investigation. So kind of along those lines, one of our uh, audience members raises the sort of appearance of impropriety that you both have commented on for this failure to transfer and just other you know related procedural issues. Um, and another audience member asked, why hasn't Chief Justice Roberts done anything? Can the Chief Justice unilaterally um, force a transfer? You know, there's nothing in the rules that authorizes that. I would think that if at some point early in this proceedings, these proceedings, he'd gotten on the phone to Chief Judge Moore and say, look, Kimberly, I really think you should transfer it. I would think she would have done it. But, you know, I don't know if he did that. Um, as I say, it's not in the rules. But one of the things uh, I'll mention here is that we haven't said anything about the Breyer Committee, which is the committee chaired by uh, former Chief uh, Justice uh, Stephen Breyer, that looked into the operation of the system. And in fact, they were the ones who suggested the, the transfer uh, proceeding uh, uh, procedure. Uh, but one of their general suggestions was that decentralization which as I mentioned was one of the key features of the 1980 Act, decentralization had probably gone a little bit too far and more power should, be, should have been granted to the Judicial Conference Committee. And in fact, the first draft of the 1980 rules tried to do that, the circus pushed back and there wasn't really much left in the rules. But that's another way of dealing with that to, to have a little bit more top-down authority from the uh, circuit from the Judicial Conference Committee. Well, uh, we are coming right up against our, our deadline. Um, and so we're just, we're not gonna be able to get to all the questions. I will note that one of our audience members um, provided another venue for folks to look at uh, Judge Newman's sort of current um, abilities. She spoke uh, live at an IP watchdog event in September and the IP watchdog has a video of her 
off the cuff without notes, 10 plus minutes uh, commentary. So if you are more interested in the sort of live evidence, uh, that's a place to direct you. Thank you, Professor Hellman and, and David. Thank you so much for your participation and preparation for today. This was fun. Uh, and Jack, I'll hand it back over to you. Well, thank you, Judge Perkins. Uh, I want to thank everyone again for being with us today and to you, Judge Perkins, for moderating the discussion. Um, I'll reiterate what you said earlier uh, with a reminder that David's full interview can be found at Original Jurisdiction and that we have a link available uh, on our event page for this program. Uh, as always, we do welcome feedback at info at fedsoc.org and please keep an eye out um, for uh, upcoming events in the near future. Uh, with that, thank you once again for being with us. We are adjourned. Mm -hmm.